Small Acre Hunting's 2018 Embrace the Journey is brought to you in partnership with Real World Wildlife Products, Radix Trail Cameras, and Treehopper LLC. Hey guys, welcome to the fifth video in the Embracing the Journey um, series. It's more or less just me cataloging the entire season um, from this the beginning of the year through to now. Um, moving forward as we enter into the hunting season, I'm gonna hopefully give you guys some more uh, type weekly type updates, just kinda give you some, some live stand video, tell you what I've been seeing, um, maybe even reach out to some of you guys, tell me what you've been seeing, report that and we'll go from there. But for this episode of Embracing the Journey, we are going to push pause on the stand discussions. Um, I know I had a couple uh, really good responses on the last stand, stand discussion, the one that I talked about at the base of that hill. Um, the next stand discussion I still plan on doing, it is uh, the, the spot that I shot splits out of at the new 22, and hopefully I will shoot Bertier out of this year. Um, we'll talk about that one in, in future episodes. Um, but this first video we're going to discuss is actually a uh, opening of the Glory Knock um, by uh, Double Take Archery. So let's get right to that. We'll check back in here, and then we got a couple more things planned for it. Hey guys, so just got done shooting um, a 35 and a 25. Um, I'm going to take those shots leading into this season. Uh, technically, the season's already open for me, with uh, September 15th being the urban reduction zone opener here in Indiana, but I didn't hunt. We've got too much to do. I don't feel like I'm ready, and I'm not going to push it. Um, I am going to try to get out here ASAP and down the doe quick. Doing that allows me actually to go after a second buck, and there are a lot of nice deer um, that we're after this year. Uh, I'll share those maybe at the end of this video but right now I want to talk to you about a new knock that I just purchased it's called the glory knock from double take archery and these things are incredible they push button deactivate basically so let me go ahead and take these out doesn't come out of this the best this broadhead target holds these things tight so bear with me let me try to zoom in and let you see. I don't know if the camera is gonna adjust. Nope, it's not. And I don't have uh, the auto focus isn't working. So let me go ahead and show you. This is made to deactivate, basically just using string. So there's a little button on the side here. And all you need is use the unserved part or no serving part of your string and push it against until the light goes off. You see the light go off? Then there's a little button there. Then once you hold that, it's off. Like it literally is that easy, guys. So you shoot it. Let me activate it, see? You recover it, you push in, hold that button, and bam, it's off. It is literally that easy. This is an amazing, amazing illuminated knock. Um, if these always light up and produce for me like all the other brands that I've used or one that I've used for the past few years, this is gonna change the entire illuminated knock world in my opinion. Um, I hate, 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 hate carrying a small little pocket knife with me or using the tip of my broadheads to push down in there and push up that to deactivate these things, charring it up, cutting them up, cutting my fingers. Um, now it's literally a push button. Everybody else out there in the knock industry needs to watch out because Glory Knock just provided hunters with a no gimmick, no BS. Uh, you know, this is just something that we needed. They didn't try to overthink it, they didn't try to overdo it, they just did what needed to be done and delivered. Get yourself some Glory Knock. They come in three different sizes. I know my. Uh, Black Eagle arrows, I believe, were the S, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, it took me forever to get these things. Uh, they were flooded with orders after the ATA show, um, but they stayed in constant communication with me. They never acted like I was bugging them every single month, it seemed, when I emailed them. They kept responding. They even offered a refund and not to fill my order, but I wanted these things, and I'm happy I hung on to the order 
because these things are amazing. I'm gonna do a little bit more shooting. It's incredible. Deactivated just like that. Lit. Not lit. It is seriously the fastest, the quickest way. So as you guys can tell, I'm pretty excited about the Glory Knock by Double Take Archery. I think it's very innovative. I've had some discussions with some people that have had some issues with the lighting of the knocks, um, them not lighting up like they should be. I have not had that issue. All three of mine have been shot and they do exactly what they're designed to do. They light up on flight. I have had no issues with knocking. I've had no issues with them falling off the string. None of that. Um, so make sure you order the proper knock. Um, there's four different sizes. There's the S, the H, the X, and the GT. So maybe that's some of the issues that have been being had, but I am really excited about these products. I will continue to let you know, and at the end of the year I'll do, hopefully, I'll have a couple live uh, examples of how well they work from the stand. Um, hopefully a couple bucks and, a, and an antlerless deer. So we'll see what happens, but let's rewind just one week to last Saturday, the 15th, where I went out to the New 22 and Pops joined me to oversee some food plots. And we, I do a little discussion on, we visit some of the Miscanthus Gigantis that I planted uh, now two years ago. It uh, was a rhizome when I planted it then, and it's doing quite well. But let's check into that video, and I'll see you back here in a little bit. Hey, guys. So I just pulled into the new 22 here. Um, isn't really where I want to be. It's September 15th. It's actually the opener of Indiana's deer reduction or urban zones, as a lot of people call them. This property, believe it or not, surprisingly, is actually in one of them as is one of our other properties that we hunt. So I could technically be hunting this morning. It's gonna be 70 degrees by 10 a.m. It's just before 9 a.m. right now. I wanted to slide in here after the sunrise. We've got a lot to do. We're gonna overseed some food plots. We're gonna fertilize some of the food plots. We're gonna check cameras and we're gonna hang one more final stand. So while I could be hunting, timing wise, it just didn't work for me to be up a tree right now. I got a lot of stuff, uh, property, prep wise that we need to do it's still real warm out it's still hot I just don't picture movement being really what I want to enjoy um, trying to hunt them and it's early I don't want to interact with them too much right now save it for better hunting time frames I may slip out uh, to the other property and try to down a doe prior to October 1st but I really don't plan on hunting much unless a cold snap comes through so that's the goal today pop should be pulling in any minute here now uh, while I'm waiting on him I'm gonna go rake a tree stand entrance check that tree stand um, and just make sure that it's good but I think first I'm gonna walk up and through just to make sure if anything's here I'm gonna make some noise and if anything's here I'm gonna let them know that I'm coming that way if they're in the bedding area right around here they can just hunker down or they can filter off nice and slow and that's how I want this day to go so I guarantee you there's deer within 100 yards of us right now there's deer always right in here in all these different bedding options here on this side of the property so just gonna let them know that I'm coming let them know that their bedding area works it alerts them of danger and they can slide off undetected so that's what I'm gonna do get started hey guys so I am kneeling in the nearest food plot to the tree stand that we've hung we're hanging one another 40 or 50 yards back down the line that'll be better for late season and even early slipping in a little bit more of an observational stand there's not as many crossings as close to it 
but it's in a good location, especially with a firearm. With a bow, it probably won't be that good because it's back off of the plots a little bit more, closer to the road. This is predominantly harvest salad with uh, some of the oats by Real World that came in. It came in tremendous, and I've actually got a soybean right here growing up through stuff. So if you remember right, this was a section that we had soybeans and it got annihilated. The deer were not allowing the beans to grow real well got decent germination out of the beans there was just a lot of pressure on them next year if we're gonna have beans and we want to have them pot out we're gonna protect them but they provided a great forage during the year now they're growing up through this stuff and you can see there's some brassica plot in here as well I don't like mixing all the small seeds with the big seeds so what we did was we planted harvest salad I came over it with soybeans as well so the harvest salad has the peas the oats the rye and the wheat came over it with the soybeans some of the soybeans that we disc through probably lived and then flattened I saw some of them but some of these are gonna be brand new this one's brand new just from the germination about four weeks ago I'll pop up on the bottom of the screen actually when we planted it's September 15th right now we're coming in we're gonna hang a stand we're gonna let the Sun burn off some of this moisture on the food plot we're gonna put fertilizer down we're gonna put more seed down in this area I probably won't overseed it much with anything um, maybe some crimson clover down and through here, but this is really thick. There is some patches that are thinner. We're going to hit real hard with oats, and this is money, guys. I mean, I've got peas growing in here. I've got everything that we've planted has germinated and germinated great. There's sections that are just getting annihilated by the deer, most likely groundhog as well. But this is a very diverse, earlier season-oriented plot because there's less brassicas, less bulb-producing uh, things in here, but the wheat and the oats and the rye will get dug through as long as it's still viable and palatable into the winter. Let's check on over to the more predominantly brassica or the plot topper and see how it's doing. So I'm kneeling now in the far west food plot from those tree stands where we just were. It's separated by a real thick uh, line of wild black raspberries and, and thorn bushes and things that you cannot get through. You'll notice this is a plot, we did not disc this. This was just top seeded over with uh, into standing beans and you can see all these beans are still trying to grow. The deer are still hitting them and they're trying to grow. I actually see one that potted out over here. We've got a couple pods over here. But again, I'm not expecting a lot out of these soybeans. They're not gonna be able to thrive. Here's a little tiny pod that's not gonna have anything in it. But uh, they'll, they'll keep trying to grow for a while and the deer will keep eating them and annihilating them. My worry though is I did not seed heavy enough with the brassicas, I don't think. There's some sections back in there that are gonna have good brassica, but I am gonna seed this real heavy with crimson clover, I've got some over there, and we're gonna seed probably an entire bag of uh, oats because there's not a lot of rain in the forecast and we're just gonna hope what germs germs. Um, this isn't quite what I wanted, but I wanted to have beans still a viable option for the deer. And I've got some more plot topper at home. I may come back and overseed this with a little bit of it. Um, slip in from the road, the deer will never know I'm here. But I'll, I'll go ahead and show you some of this. This is the far north plot on the east side of the property of the food. 
It's on the northeast side actually. I'm panning slightly west now and now I'm facing west but you'll notice we did mainly brassicas here because we weren't able to we were able to disc it but it was really wet couldn't really pack it well and we knew the small seeds of the brassica would need the least amount of penetration into the soil so it came up great for us um, you can see the four-wheeler tracks through there from today we fertilized it um, there's no rain in the forecast here soon so we're gonna let the morning dew take care of the fertilizer overseeded some rye into a portion of it back here and uh, when we have rain in the forecast again, I'm, I'll come in and I'll hit the brassica with uh, some urea. But look at that right there. That, ladies and gentlemen, illustrates how well the planting of oats in a trail will do. The camera is about a foot. Let me make it level. The camera is about a foot above the ground. And you can see. Those leaves are almost starting to obstruct its view. Hey guys, another quick uh, video. Behind me you'll notice is actually a line of Miscanthus giganus. I planted uh, nine or ten, I can't remember in there. I only had one not live. But you'll notice I don't really, uh, I don't really keep it down for its weed competition and growth. I mow right up beside it, you'll see. Um, but that's really all I've done. This is only year number two, and those were rhizomes. So they're basically a cluster this year, if you will, if I dug them out of the ground. But I say by next year, I'm really going to be able to start seeing that this is starting to become a blockade. Um, here, let me hold it right like this. Already doing a pretty decent job for what it's supposed to do, so... I'm very happy and uh, only expect better and bigger things next year out of this line. So. so like I said earlier, we're not going to have a tree stand discussion video in this episode just to keep it a little shorter. However, there was one of the biggest questions I always get is about clover, getting clover established. And I think it's a lot of the times because clover is such an easy thing to implement into a property. So I wanted to add... Um, I've used clips of this every now and then uh, before, but I wanted to add this. This is me visiting the property. It was late July, and I was doing some clover maintenance, and I just kind of talk about what my maintenance and just clover in general and how I treat it, and I, I show you a couple spots on the property that I've got clover in and how I did each of them kind of. So let's watch that video, and then uh, I will see you guys next time on the next episode of Embracing the Journey. Remember, while you're out there, guys, it is not all about whether you get a tag filled or you don't. It's not about whether you see success or failure. The whole entire journey that encompasses hunting is why it's so hard to explain to people why we love doing this, why we are addicted to hunting. Um, if it was just about the kill, I don't think I would be nearly as excited about hunting. I don't think I would be into it. Um, I enjoy everything from preseason scouting, shed hunting, walking the property, providing food sources, scouting, checking trail cameras, watching the deer from the stand. It's just the whole journey is something that we need to start getting back to. I think we, we as a society in the hunting world has lost sight that this whole thing is, is just beautiful for lack of a better term. And we need to, we need to begin to attempt to convey that to people and let them know that you know hunters we're not just a bunch of bloodthirsty dudes out there like we love and appreciate conservation nature we're fighting for our public lands we want you and i and the bird hunters the the deer hunters the bird watchers the hikers the campers all to have uh these public lands to 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 visit you know, I want my kids to be able to go up to Boundary Waters like I'm going to do again this next year. I want them to be able to travel out west and go to all these uh, state and federal and national parks and, and be able to just fish and camp and hike. And, you know, hunters provide the largest funding from public people for conservation. And we need to we need we need to stress that to people. We need to stress that, you know, we are hardworking Americans that care about our country care about conservation we're not just bloodthirsty dudes out there chasing 
you know, whatever it might be that day that we're out there trying to, uh, to harvest. So watch this video on the Clover guys. Thanks for checking out. Be sure to like, subscribe, and click that bell for the alerts here on YouTube, on Facebook. Be sure to like the page, share it, follow it. Um, the more people that follow, the more stuff I can provide. So enjoy it. Thanks. God bless. Hey guys, so we're out at the property and I'm doing a little bit of clover uh, work today, running the brush hog around. It's been a while, we've gotten a lot of rain and here taking care of the clover. But one thing I wanted to show you guys really quick is I talked about frost seed in this uh, area right here. Just this uh, early winter, I came in here and frost seeded. This is that, that path that leads back into the bedding area along this uh, little cove kind of where it gets back in there and then there's some miscanthus giganus that planted in there but this is what frost seeding can do for you guys timed right it works into the soil um, this is an area i didn't even glide treat it was just mowed and kept down frost seeded it and look what happened i mean guys that's uh over ankle deep clover I'm looking through here and it is getting browsed heavy. A lot of browse, which makes sense. I mean, it's the closest thing to the bedding area in here for them. I might even be within 20 yards of a deer right now, believe it or not, but uh, they're used to humans to the point where it's not gonna disrupt them too much. I mean, I'm not gonna go banging around in their bedding area. I see some Miscanthus giganus that has managed to grow right here. Looks like one, two, three, four, five of them took. Six right here up by me. Um, I'm not going to do much to them, I'm just going to hopefully they grow and, and strengthen this corridor edge. That way if I ever do come in and clear these trees and such that you see, I've got a hard quarter or a hard border right here along this clover plot to separate it from the future bedding area if I ever do that and plant switch in here. So let's get back to the clover. And guys, this is the parking lot. You'll see all the clover flowers that are here. This area again was just grasses and I frost seeded into it and look how much clover. Yeah, you got a lot of weeds in here, you got some other stuff growing, but look at that. That's all just from frost seeding. So I just got done mowing the clover and I'm actually sitting in the clover and I left a little patch so you can kind of tell. That's at the level of the grass, so probably another inch or two down to the ground. So this clover that I didn't cut right here, some of the flowers are eight or nine inches tall. This will be the second time I cut this uh, clover here. So just goes to show when you got when you got sun, it's been a clear summer up here in Northern Indiana, but it's been rainy. We've been getting a lot of, a lot of rain until the last couple weeks, then it really dried up. We got rain coming tomorrow. So you're probably wondering, well, man, it's been kind of a drought tide. The clover's not quite as tall as it was last time when I cut it, but I think I can let it get a little long last time but I like to do that before the first cutting of the year. But the reason why I'm cutting it today, guys, is for the very reason that I shared in the last episode, and that's what this Whitetail Minute's about, is strictly clover. You know, we already talked about establishing it and such. This video is about upkeep and maintenance. Timing your mowings appropriately is key. I mowed it as low as my brush hog would go almost a day, comfortably without scraping dirt. So some spots in here, I raised it up, I, eh, it's three inches. I cut it to probably three inches. Um, so there's stems everywhere. And that's a little bit lower than what some guys say, but you know what? I've got a 100% chance of rain the next two days. Some kind of rain. I'm gonna get moisture, and it's supposed to be all day on Saturday. There's a chance over 80% the entire day. So now is when I wanted to get in here. So those of you guys out there working like I used to with a push mower or a lawn mower that you only can raise the deck so high, Now's the time. It's, it's the timing. I would rather let my clover get too long and cut it later if I time it right with the rain than to cut it too soon. Um, but just let the weather dictate, especially working on small properties. You got to time your mowings. You got to time your plantings. Um, you know, if it wasn't going to rain, I wouldn't be in here cutting it actually even on mine. Even though I have a brush hog and a big lawnmower, I probably would have let it go and just hope for the best. But here, let me pluck one of these. So there's one stem of a clover and it's been chewed on at the top, but it's probably about eight or nine inches tall. So that's how tall my clover was in here. And now, you know, I bet you the longest I can probably find is probably three inches or so. So it's all about timing guys, 
establish your clover however you want, but check out the uh, episode number three of Embrace the Journey if you want to watch the two preferred methods or me discuss the two preferred methods that I have. Otherwise, to upkeep clethodem, to keep the grasses out, mowing to keep the broadleafs out. That's really all you got to do. This I had a, I had some broadleafs throughout here in the uh, clover, but this mowing will take care of them. There wasn't many patches of grass. I still got some, but I'll probably come back when I plant in the fall and hit those with uh, clethodem or when I'm back out here checking cameras in two weeks. But just wanted to give you this quick whitetail minutes, guys, on upkeep of your clover. It's really not that hard. Um, and just so you guys know, when I come in to uh, fertilize in the fall, I'll probably throw down some phosphorus and uh, potassium, but I will not be throwing down anything with nitrogen. The only reason I might throw nitrogen down with it is if the bag's on sale and it's got a little bit of nitrogen in it, but clover fixes plenty of nitrogen. So, Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Embrace the Journey, the 2018 season here at Small Acre Hunting. Click that subscribe button, like and share this video on all social media platforms, and be sure to follow me at Small Acre Hunting on Facebook or via the website www.smallacrehunting.com. And as always, guys, God bless and good luck out there.